I'd like to present to you a paper which was published in Germany at the Goethe University in Frankfurt in 2002. And the journal in which it appeared is called a Forschungen zur Freuen Neuzeit, which has to do with uh, uh, Renaissance in the early modern period. And the title, as you can see, because there are copies of it to be had on the table outside, is Tragedy, Hamlet, and Luther. It is in part a speculative and somewhat hieratic uh, paper and not so much a work of historicism, which is why it came out in a German journal, because they not only can tolerate such things far better than the Americans in the discipline of literature, but they actually like it, as do, I think, psychoanalysts who, after all, write for journals like American Imago, which sounds something like this piece. The heroes of Homer's Iliad refer to themselves as subjects of future song. But unlike those heroes, the poet of the Iliad is also privy, through the help of the muse, to what the gods say in their great Olympic elsewhere. And it usually includes the plan of what happens next in the poem. Patroclus must die in book 16 because Zeus has already said so in book 15. The idea that we must die so that later people may have something to sing about is strangely equivalent to the idea that we must die because the gods have sung our death already. The present is a text sung by the gods in the past and by human beings in the future. Again, the present is a text sung by the divine in the past and by human beings in the future who remember us. Among all the arts, theater is uniquely able to invoke, evoke this uncanny sense that our real historical world is textual for a divine outsider and that its apparent spontaneity and contingency are only real for us. Meta-theatrical allusion, when theater refers to itself as theater, is the authorial device whereby characters refer to their own actual status as people in a play or declare their own potential as possible subjects of as yet unwritten drama. And here are quotations from two different plays, and there's an error in the lineation which creates the false illusion that this is all one chunk of poetry from a single play. The first one is from the tragedy of Julius Caesar, and the second from Antony and Cleopatra. How many ages hence shall this our lofty scene be acted over in states unborn and accents yet unknown? How many times shall Caesar bleed in sport? Sport being play, the drama. And Cleopatra says the quick comedians, meaning the comedians who are alive after I, Cleopatra, am long dead. The quick comedians extemporally will stage us and present our Alexandrian revels. Antony shall be brought drunken forth, and I shall see some squeaking Cleopatra boy my greatness in the likeness of a whore. Or they use language which insinuates this. We did think it writ down in our duty. Or, as Macbeth says, to the last syllable of recorded time. Every drama performs the bondage of the characters to the script and the stage, the relative liberty and omniscience of the spectators. The tragic drama has its origins in the ritual worship of Dionysus, whose contagious ecstasy liberates our perceptions from the burdens of the will in history. Of course, ecstasy literally means a standing outside, and this traditionally refers to the standing outside oneself when one becomes possessed by Dionysus and transformed temporarily into the character whom one, as an actor, portrays. But I would suggest that the other thing from which one is standing out is history. Nietzsche said tragedy brought metaphysical solace, 
that of course is from his uh, birth of tragedy from the spirit of music, an early work. Nietzsche said tragedy brought metaphysical solace because it reminds us of an eternal perspective from which our present sufferings can be enjoyed as aesthetic appearances. Nietzsche also said we have art so that we do not perish from the truth we can transform the truth instead into something that we can experience as aesthetic. We transform the truth into art. Ekphrasis, which is defined in a footnote below, and metatheatrical allusion, so common in the drama of Shakespeare, insinuate or suggest and thematize or discuss the ontological and epistemological issues that already inhere in the theatrical setup itself. By ontological, I refer to the branch of philosophy within metaphysics, which deals with the being or non-being of things from Plato's ontos, being. And by epistemological, of course, I refer to the branch of philosophy, which deals with knowledge and claims to knowledge from the Greek episteme, knowledge. People doing things according to a pre-existing story, the script, contained within it the people contained within the story, as they are contained within the space of the stage with its invisible fourth wall. Our weird liberty as spectators in the drama is that while we can do nothing, we need do nothing. Oedipus and Creon, Hamlet and Laertes are doing the living now. We who watch are powerless invulnerable observers, relishing our safety from what so wretchedly destroys the legendary figures on the stage. In his famous treatise, The Poetics, Aristotle claims that tragedy provides a catharsis, a purging. And of what does it purge us? Pity and terror. It purges us of pity insofar as we don't identify with the hero in his or her destruction on the stage. We have pity for the protagonist. It purges us of terror insofar as we do identify with the protagonist on the stage. Over the bridge of this safe distance, we are drawn toward an imaginative identification, there's the terror, with the characters in the drama. And on returning, we experience the suggestion that we too are the captives of a limited domain of meanings beyond which mind and will alike come to naught. And the name for that is fate or destiny. That the Elizabethan theater inherits this dynamic from its Greek ancestor is as much as saying that what goes on inside the amphitheater in ancient Greece and what goes on inside Shakespeare's globe are both rightly called drama, the doings. But Hamlet articulates his captivity to the play in a philosophically special manner that bespeaks an interpretive crisis in the mind of the culture through which Shakespeare wrote the play. Hamlet is revelatory and diagnostic of this crisis. It could not have been written in the medieval period. And Luther's conceptual entailments are found writ large in it. Recall that perhaps the peak of Luther's theological and polemical activity is the 1530s. He starts in 1517, breaking from his old identity as an Augustinian monk, as Catholic as it is possible to be, walking up a mountain on his knees to pay homage to a statue of the Virgin Mary. and hallucinating the presence of the devil in his monastic cell as he studied, at whom he threw a bottle of ink when the devil said to him, very good, Martin, soon you'll be more pious than God. He strove, after all, to be the most humble person in the world, which is grandiosity itself. Shakespeare, for his part, is born in 1564, dies in 1616, and seems to have begun this play in 1599. It was first presented on the stage in 1601 and published in 1604. 
And therefore, it makes sense to talk about Shakespeare's consciousness as formed in part by the emergence of Lutheran theology and the explosion we call the Reformation. A great uh, literary critic of some generations ago, Harry Levin, wrote in a wonderful book, a thin book, called The Question of Hamlet, it's worth remembering that Shakespeare had grandparents who were Catholic with no alternative. because the Reformation hadn't happened yet. It is Greek because it is tragic. The Shakespearean drama of 1601 is also a late Renaissance moment, modern as anything written since, because it catches sight of its own ontological situation, questions of reality and unreality, in a quintessentially modern way. The predicament of the young Hamlet is a peculiar combination of being confined in too small a space with no room to move and being exposed and shelterless too much in the sun, which is from his first utterance in the play. Not so, my lord, I am too much in the sun. The striking phase at Act 2, Scene 2, Line 254 is paradoxical. Oh, God, I could be bounded in a nutshell and count myself a king of infinite space, were it not that I have bad dreams. The speaker of this sentiment could interpret his way out of the misery of confinement, and what is psychoanalysis but that? Count myself a king, where counting is interpreting, valuing, but that he has bad dreams, which are not open to interpretation, right, Traumdeutung, until one has woken up. While the bad dreams are in progress, one can't refuse their badness or interpret it away. It's not how nightmares work any more than the damned in Dante's Inferno can look on the bright side of things. Or the elect in the Paradiso find themselves in a foul mood. In the afterworld, the product of a medieval piety for which the sacraments carry their own effective virtue, quite apart from our feelings about them, for they are magical, value is already written into things, and therefore appearances cannot deceive. The badness of hell is not a matter of our decision. Heaven is blissful no matter who you are. It is impossible to be manic depressive in either of those kingdoms. And for this reason, appearances cannot deceive, and the human person has only a minimal responsibility for interpreting or conferring value upon things and states of affairs. In short, he or she has a negligible hermeneutic burden where hermeneutics refers to interpretation, from the Greek hermenouin, to interpret. It's perhaps worth mentioning that hermeneutics has two origins, one in Jerusalem and Babylon in the invention of the Talmud, which is interpretation and commentary, in other words, upon the Torah, and the other, uh, not Hebraic, but Hellenic, with its origins in Alexandria, and the interpretations of Homer, the Odyssey and the Iliad, by the scholiasts, or scholars of Homer. So it's got a Hellenic origin and a Hebrew origin as well. That burden of interpretation was increasing rapidly at the historical moment when Shakespeare's Hamlet appeared. It is nearly contemporaneous, for example, with Montaigne's great expansions of subjectivity, the essays, a French word, which means attempts, uh, tries at getting something said that was worth hearing. That's what Montaigne had the humility to call uh, the uh, papers that he wrote. Here is the most explicit passage from the play on this theme. Uh, what have you deserved of fortune that she sends you to prison hither? Hamlet asks of his old school chums, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. And they reply, 
prison, my lord? Uh, uh, sorry, that's a bit later. Then is doomsday near. Yeah, w what is your news? None but that the world's grown honest. Then is doomsday near. But your news is not true. Let me question more in particular. What have you, my good friends, deserved at the hands of fortune that she sends you to prison hither? Prison, my lord? Denmark's a prison. Then is the world one, a goodly one, in which there are many confines, wards, and dungeons, Denmark being one of the worst. We think not so, my lord. Why, then, tis none to you, for there is nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. To me, it is a prison. Why, then, your ambition makes it one. Tis too narrow for your mind. Oh, God, I could be bounded in a nutshell and count myself a king of infinite space were it not that I have bad dreams. Hamlet speaks as though not Denmark alone, but the whole relativity of things in the post-medieval world was the prison. That the world is a prison is an ancient Gnostic idea but again, not a medieval one. An idea whereby a lesser god, the demiurge, or demiurgos, the craftsman, has imprisoned man in this cosmos and appointed the stars as wardens to prevent our escape, thus preventing our reunion with the one true god who for the Gnostics cannot have made so evil a world as this. And if you're interested in Gnosticism, as you may know, the chief book on the subject remains The Gnostic Religion by Hans Jonas, J-O-N-A-S. The, wor the world is a prison precisely because appearances are not reliable indicators of reality. That strong fathers die, that loving mothers forget them and remarry, that wise kings are murdered, and especially that one may smile and smile and be a villain, horrifically increases the burdens of interpretation. It expels one from the childlike Eden of emotional and intellectual passivity, the trust that appearances are reliable, upon which both medieval Catholic piety, with its spectacle, smells and bells that can be appreciated without literacy, and medieval ceremonial monarchy, the subject of Shakespeare's Richard II, depend. Again, the world is a prison preci precisely because appearances are not reliable indicators of reality. This expels one from the childlike Eden of emotional and intellectual passivity, the trust that appearances are reliable, upon which both medieval Catholic piety and medieval ceremonial monarchy depend. The university from which Hamlet and Horatio have recently taken leave is Wittenberg, the site of Dr. Faustus's experiments in the freedom of the will, in Christopher Marlowe's marvelous tragedy of Dr. Faustus, which is written in 1592, and the center of Luther's Reformation. It was in Wittenberg that Luther nailed his famous 95 Theses to the door of the church. And there's a long footnote here, which I won't read, which comes from uh, Sir Thomas More's History of King Richard III, or uh, if you prefer, St. Thomas More, because he was canonized after his execution. This argument turns upon the structure of drama as a genre and its central metaphysical issue, the limitations of human knowledge and the ethical obligation to act within and ultimately act into those limits. Dr. Faustus, after all, is destroyed precisely because of his effort to break through those limits of the human estate. Hamlet has an Augustinian crisis of the will in which a painful transition is made from ineffectual to effectual volition, 
Why do I call it an Augustinian crisis of the will? Because in his confessions, St. Augustine described his struggle genuinely and completely to convert to Christianity from paganism. He was born in 354 and died in 430 AD or CE. And you can feel the flavor of that struggle in his famous utterance, Lord, give me piety, excuse me, Lord, give me chastity, but not yet. But Hamlet also comes to the knowledge that action can and must be performed despite the radical uncertainty of his place in the world, which is our place as well. As these two movements, one of the will, the other of knowledge, converge, and that sounds like analysis to me, right? insight on the one hand, relationship on the other, Hamlet moves from passive observance of reliable appearances which is childhood, to active interpretation and intervention among deceptive ones. Active interpretation and intervention among deceptive ones. There's a marvelous book in the um, academic discipline they call education uh, called Forms of Intellectual and Ethical Development in the College Years. It's a bit like the moral stages of Kohlberg, except it's really more about intellectual development, in which uh, it's demonstrated that this is experienced as a crisis in adolescence and that uh, adulthood can be said to consist in the ability to tolerate the radical uncertainty and unsafety of this world and yet to act effectively within it despite that previously immobilizing uncertainty. In their youth, the undergraduates on their way back from Wittenberg are doubly the protagonists of this crisis. They epitomize the very traits which the city of Faustus and Luther had recently come to signify. The tormented conscience, the war against authority, ambivalent heroics, and a vastly expanded role for inner feeling and decision. Inner feeling being Luther's faith, and outward action being works, which are emphasized in the Judaic and Catholic traditions, as found not least in the letter of James, the elder brother of Jesus. In Shakespeare's tragedy of Julius Caesar, which seems to have been written shortly before Hamlet, Brutus waits for the conspirators to arrive at his home and experiences his private insomnia and anxiety as a political crisis. The state of a man, the microcosm, like to a little kingdom, suffers then the nature of an insurrection. What a remarkable thing. 300 years before Freud, to speak of the self as having parts which contend with one another in what we call conflict and insurrection. Hamlet, who also, like Brutus, has a regicidal or king-killing ambition, experiences something similar on board ship to England, and the anxiety that keeps him from sleep, like Brutus, soon keeps him from death. Sir, in my heart there was a kind of fighting that would not let me sleep. Methought I lay worse than the mutinies in the Bilbos. Mutinies, of course, are mutineers, and the Bilbos are the stocks. Rashly, and praised be rashness for it, let us know our indiscretion sometimes serves us well when our dear plots do pall. In other words, our plans darken and come to nothing. And that should teach us there's a divinity that shapes our ends, rough hew them how we will. The mutinies and the Bilbos are those who rebelled against the captain of the ship and were put in the stocks on deck. Like the man bounded in a nutshell, these mutinies are better sleepers than Hamlet, in whose soul the fighting is still going on, while in Brutus' figure of the inward insurrection, 
anxiety is explicitly compared to political strife, here the two kinds of violence are merely juxtaposed, and that in three layers. One, the fighting in the heart causes insomnia, which brings on comparison with, two, the mutinous sailors punished in the stocks, who have their counterparts in, three, the mutinous impulses inside Hamlet's mind, the rashness and indiscretion. A rhetoric of authority and resistance comes with this image of mutinies in the bilbos, the hortatory subjunctive or imperative, the command, let us know. The gentle chiding in, that should teach us. And the political psychology of our indiscretion sometimes serves us well, amount to the famous precept that closes this speech. There's a divinity that shapes our ends, rough hew them how we will. There's an author that shapes the play to which we are captive, however we lay our plans. And of course, Tom Stoppard inherits this theme from Shakespeare in his marvelous drama, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are Dead, which is directly about the captivity of the characters to the script, and by extension, the captivity of us to fate. Hamlet's dear plots are the projections of consciousness. You know, Robert Burns, the Scottish poet, says the best laid plans of mice and men aft gang a glay. <laughs> they often go awry. Hamlet's plots are the projections of consciousness which, as they come to grief in the outer world, are repaired or replaced by apparently rash impulses. Very good. But what is hard to learn, what takes teaching by a difficult act of inference that needed five acts for its accomplishment, is not the supervenience or coming next of impulse upon intention, the internal politics of the will whereby one part of self overcomes another, but that of divinity upon the whole will, the mastery of our lives by a God who is no part of us, Impulse supervenes, or comes next, precisely when our dear plots do pall, when our conscious designs differ from the God's design. Divinity employs our own rashness and indiscretion to subvert our conscious intentions. There's a marvelous quotation about this from Macbeth when he and Banquo are confronted with the sight and sound of the weird sisters and talk about the way that uh, oracular discourse like the sisters' prophecies sometimes uh, is true but leads us astray by some ambiguity that we cannot figure out. The presence of the term plot, which means both plan and an area of land, as for instance, the a plot in a cemetery or the plot on which a battle takes place. Truly to speak and with no addition, we go to gain a little plot of land whereon the numbers cannot try the cause, says one of Fortinbras' soldiers. We are fighting for the possession of a little plot of land so tiny that it isn't big enough tomb and continent enough to hide the slain. It isn't big enough to serve as the burial ground for all the soldiers who will die defending and attacking it. Plot, right, it means plan and a space of dirt. The presence of the term plot suggests the shaping hand of Shakespeare, because plays have plots. And the analogy on which all the ontological themes in the drama rest, that between the author and the god the dramatis personae, the people in the play, and the spectators, the people in the seats and the readers of the drama, the play and the world. Plot occurs in Hamlet in another sense, in the seventh soliloquy, when Fortinbras, whose name means strong in arms, is seen to march against the Poles for a nearly worthless plot of land. 2,000 souls and 20,000 ducats will not debate the question of this straw. This is the imposthume, or bursting inward, 
like an abscess. This is the imposthume of much wealth and peace that inward breaks and shows no cause without why the man dies. This is restated some 30 lines later. Well, to my shame, I see the imminent death of 20,000 men that for a fantasy and trick of fame go to their graves like beds, fight for a plot whereon the numbers cannot try the cause. An imposthume is an ulcerous sore, part of that pervasive trope in which moral political corruption is denoted by the physical corruption of rotting, rankness, poisoning, cankers, and ulceration. The clear merit of this trope is that it combines the comparison of two kinds of harm with the idea that each can be invisible. What are the two kinds of harm? Moral decay and physical decay, both of which are referred to as corruption. Mother, lay not that flattering unction to your soul, which not thy trespass, but my madness speaks. It will but skin and film the ulcerous place, whilst rank corruption, mining all within, infects unseen. The clear merit of this trope of corruption is that it combines the comparison of two kinds of harm, with the idea that each can be invisible, festering beneath a deceptively healthy surface. It will but skin and film. There's the line I just quoted. At first, it seems this discovery might make appearances intelligible once again by a thorough reversal of them. What looks healthy is corrupt, and vice versa. But it isn't as simple as that. It's not as if one finds out that black is white and white black, and all you need do is invert the sign of every signifier and come to the truth, because there are a million shades of gray in between. The poison in the old king's ear, that was how Claudius killed Hamlet the Elder, and in the porches of mine ears did pour the leprous distillment. The poison in the old king's ear made his skin break out in crusty scabs, though he was himself the guiltless victim. But the incipient confidence afforded by this skepticism is quickly destabilized by a look at a few counterexamples. Ophelia's honesty and her madness are each apparent in behavior. Appearances are not deceiving there. She looks crazy, and she is. Horatio is as trustworthy as he seems. Not all appearances are deceptive means we have the burden of having to figure out which, which appearances are deceptive, which are not, and everything in between. Unless, as our inspector told us about the Warren Commission, we just rely on the stature of the men on the commission. Then we have no interpretive burden at all, because appearances are reassuringly clear. Horatio is as trustworthy as he seems, and this young Fortinbras, whose campaign looks so bold and noble, turns out to be a new paradigm of honor. Rightly to be great, says Hamlet, having seen the transit through Denmark of Fortinbras' army. Rightly to be great is not to stir without great argument but greatly to find quarrel in a straw when honor's at the stake. In other words, real greatness comes from fighting with tremendous determination and seriousness over a cause which is trivial. Though Hamlet's first judgment was a skeptical one, this campaign of Fortinbras and his army with its gorgeous military show is in fact a waste of wealth and peace. He soon decides that the very disproportion between the cost and the benefit makes Fortinbras' campaign definitive of greatness. The marching army can't be another example of hidden evil, deceptive appearances, Hamlet decides, precisely because the tiny benefit isn't large enough to conceal the cost. The contested ground is too small to entomb the dead who fought for it. The argument is roughly that of the third soliloquy of Hamlet, where the mootness of Hecuba's grief 
its pointlessness makes this player here, the actor who recited the description of it, a great actor because he responded to it as though it were his own grief. And all for nothing. For Hecuba. What's Hecuba to him or he to Hecuba that he should weep for her? The lines following compare the actor's fictive and therefore trivial occasion for response with Hamlet's great occasion. What would he do? And he the motive and the cue for passion that I have. For clarity, I am referring there to the moment when the actors or players arrive at the palace of Elsinore. Hamlet greets them, gets very excited, and asks them to recite a speech he heard once from a play about Dido. And the lead actor obliges Hamlet by reciting the speech in which, uh, during the Trojan War, at its denouement when the Greeks win, Pyrrhus, the son of Achilles, slaughters the king of the Trojans, old Priam, in the presence of his wife, old Hecuba. They too had 50 daughters, the two of them, and 50 sons, almost all of whom were slaughtered in the war. The actor who is reciting this speech reacts as though Hecuba's fate were his own. And Hamlet says, when he's alone, is it not monstrous <clears throat> that this player here, but in a fiction, in a dream of passion, could force his soul so to his own conceit that from her workings all his visage wan, tears in his eyes, distraction in his aspect, a broken voice, and his whole function suiting with forms to his conceit, whilst I, a dull and muddy metal rascal, peak like John of Dreams, I'm pregnant of my cause and can say nothing. What would he do? Had he the motive and the cue for passion that I have? So the actor's reason for getting all worked up is a trivial, fictional one. What's he to Hecuba? Or Hecuba to him that he should weep for her? Hamlet's occasion for action, on the contrary, is about as big as it could possibly be, overwhelming, and it would seem immobilizing. How then does he break out of that interpretive prison at the end of Act 4 and succeed in killing the king in Act 5? The answer is, it seems to me, that in the graveyard scene and the scene when Hamlet observes the marching of young Fortinbras, his foil, and Fortinbras' army, all human goals are reduced to triviality compared with death, the great equalizer, which, as we'll see when we get there, equalizes peasants, lawyers, real estate people, the wealthy, Julius Caesar, Alexander the Great, and Adam himself. What would he do had he the motive and the cue for passion that I have? The same comparison occurs in the seventh soliloquy as Hamlet watches Fortinbras. How stand I, then, that have a father killed, a mother stained? It is as if the large scale of Hamlet's reasons for action made action impossible or else inadequate, since great action must, in a post-heroic skeptical world, have a trivial occasion greatly to find quarrel in a straw. This is a variant of the doctrine of friendship that keeps Hamlet bound to Horatio. He praises Horatio, and Horatio says, uh, that he should stop, and Hamlet says, nay, do not think I flatter. For what advancement may I hope from thee? that no revenue hast but thy good spirits to feed and clothe thee. Why should the poor be flattered? You see, the great praise can be genuine and not mere flattery because the man being praised is, in his holdings in this world, quite poor and trivial. 
Whereas, when you praise a rich person, you might just be flattering them because their holdings in this world are enormous. The material worth of Horatio is negligible, therefore the moral value of his friendship is great. This is a traditional point found both in the Gospels, particularly in Luke 14, 12 to 14, and Luther. To the effect that generosity is more meaningful if the recipient is poor, since he can give no gift in return that might diminish the purity of the giver's motives. The corollary is the depravity of man, since it is our worthlessness that makes God's mercy so valuable. If we were capable of repaying him with perfect obedience, his mercy would be less exalted. That recognizably Lutheran point, which is nearly ubiquitous in his works, is scored comically against Polonius in the conversation about the players. My lord, I will use them according to their desert. God's bodkin man, much better. Use every man after his desert, and who shall escape whipping? Use them after your own honor and dignity. The less they deserve, the more merit is in your bounty. Take them in. In the shift of sensibility which has its convergent sources in Hamlet's adolescence, Reformation theology, and the undoing of the Danish succession, nothing can be trusted as an authentic act of the virtuous self that has more than a trivial object in the outer world. <clears throat> One way that people talk about trauma with a big T is that it costs us our capacity to trust appearances. What we could take for granted before the trauma, we can no longer take for granted afterward, the reliability of appearances. Not only generosity to others, as in the praising of Horatio and the hospitality to the players, but all other virtues of one's own conduct depend for their authenticity upon contempt for the facts at hand. Any adequation between the material causes of action and its inner motive produces hypocrisy. The unreconstructed Catholic decadence that looks for merit in works. I cannot pronounce whether this is Shakespeare's argument or not, but it certainly is Luther's, and it's congruent with one vector inside Shakespeare. This is a world in which the will's slavery to the object of desire can only be overcome by the choice of a trivial object. Fortinbras is able to act because he is confident that honor, and not wealth or power, is at the stake. But he can only be sure of this if the plot of land for which he fights is nearly worthless. Hamlet's praise of Horatio is authentic because it can't buy anything. Horatio having nothing, Hamlet needs but good spirits. This priority of feeling over the material world is, as I have argued, newly intensified at the time of the writing. What I wish to emphasize here is the way the struggle for freedom, an expanded space for the subject to work his will, entails greater and greater constriction. Compare the two precedents I cited above. Luke chapter 14, verses 12 through 14. When thou makest a dinner or a supper, call not thy friends, nor thy brethren, neither thy kinsmen, nor thy rich neighbors lest they also bid thee again. In other words, lest they return the invitation, invitation and invite you to their house for dinner later. And a recompense made to thee. But when thou makest a feast, call the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and thou shalt be blessed, for they cannot recompense thee. For thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. And Luther himself, the modern Paul, writes in The Freedom of a Christian, which is an essay sometimes uh, translated with the title On Christian Liberty. He wrote it in 
German and wrote it in Latin at the same time and dared send it directly to Pope Leo X. If, however, you wish to pray fast or establish a foundation in the church, I advise you to be careful not to do it in order to obtain some benefit, whether temporal or eternal, whether in this world or the next. For you would do injury to your faith, which alone offers you all things. Luther has heard the ethical mise en abime, the fall into an abyss. At the end of Jesus's exhortation, in which the lust for spiritual rewards simply replaces the lust for material ones. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Indeed, this was Luther's chronic experience as a young monk tortured by his conscience for the inevitable self-congratulations he felt upon completion of any good work. Very good, Martin. Soon you'll be more pious than God. The hundreds of prescribed daily acts of piety which constitute monastic life, or indeed the halakha in Judaism, were for Luther so many incidents of vanity and petty pride in having done the right thing. Who is from here than whom? The doctrine of justification by faith was Luther's solution to this problem, a solution which appeared to circumvent all the interpretive pitfalls of human action in one fell swoop by overcoming works. In the italicized passage above, Luther is on his rhetorical guard against both kinds of rewards, temporal and eternal. But this vigilance is itself a clear sign that little ground has been gained. Like Fortinbras, tiny plot, the epistemological entailments of the Reformation have nearly rendered its doctrinal achievement nugatory or trivial. The dialectic here, the process by which the Reformation unfolds, is that before it happens, people become sick and tired, as Chaucer already was, of the hypocrisy of the clergy who sell forgiveness, perform so and so many good works, recitations of prayers, participation in sacraments, uh, giving to charity and the poor. And by those actions, you will be forgiven. But it is discovered that people can do those actions cynically, merely for forgiveness without any empathy for those they benefit, or perhaps without any genuine belief in the God who commands them. The clergy themselves, in selling indulgences, tickets out of purgatory, are being hypocritical because their real goal, thought Luther and his fellow Protestants, is to acquire the money. If therefore appearances can be deceiving, it must be that what really justifies us, saves us, gets us into heaven, ransoms us from sin, death, hell, and the devil, is the inner man, what is inside faith, our belief. Very good. The trouble is, as so many of us have found, you cannot, by an act of will, become persuaded that the Christian truth is true. No one, indeed, can by an act of will persuade him or herself that any proposition is true. You either are persuaded or not. Wouldn't you prefer to believe that President Kennedy was slaughtered on the streets of Dallas like a dog by a lone nut for no reason, rather than that the government you have trusted and even loved your whole life lay him down in the dust with his ancestors because he stopped the Vietnam War? What a crisis of faith. What loneliness and isolation at the cocktail party for the person who is persuaded by a look at the evidence. Better to avoid that terrible position by ignoring the evidence altogether. And so we do. How painful it was when the weapons of mass destruction were discovered not to have existed, that the Bush administration had lied 
but it wasn't nearly as painful as seeing the truth of the assassination of, say, Dr. Martin Luther King, which was demonstrated in a court of law in a wrongful death suit by the King family in 1995, which they won, proving legally that this was an act of state, which is the title of the book by the King family's lawyer, William Pepper, an act of state, the execution of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who was responsible, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, and the police department of Memphis, Tennessee. It was way less painful to find that the Bush administration had lied because everyone knew it. It didn't create isolation. It didn't make you a dissident. It was safe to notice that fact. Well, if you cannot choose to be persuaded, then you can't get faith from an act of will. You can do works through an act of will, give to the poor. That was what made Catholicism work. It was up to you to earn salvation. Luther said you could only earn salvation by being convinced that God became a man, came down to earth, said and did the following things, was crucified, was dead for three days, re-emerged from death, returned to earth, appeared, said the following things, and will come back in 1,000 years to judge the quick and the dead. Since it is awfully difficult to persuade oneself of these things, many people suffered terrible pangs of conscience and fears of hell until John Calvin came and said, nothing can earn us salvation. It must all be predestined by the will of God for reasons that shall remain utterly inscrutable to us. That's the dialectic. From Catholicism, we're saved by works. And appearances are reliable. To Lutheranism, appearances are not reliable. We must be saved by something invisible that does not appear, namely faith. To Calvinism, neither of those two things will save us. It's all predestined. We cannot earn it. This was the argument of Max Weber's Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism, which said the Americans decided that if there's nothing we can do to earn faith, we might as well, to earn salvation, we might as well enrich ourselves with conspicuous consumption and wealth because that will give us confidence and impress our neighbors that we have been blessed and might be destined for salvation. The play seems to believe in the natural depravity of humankind the Lutheran phrase, even as it presents the struggle of the Renaissance man, what Henry V in Shakespeare called the full fraught man, that living exemplum who dignifies humanity by embodying the whole catalog of virtues listed by Ophelia at Act Three, Scene One, the glass of fashion, and so on, to redeem his times. The most unabashedly Catholic moments in the play's implicit theology are those concerned with the mechanical give and take of reward and punishment in the sacramental system. The ghosts lament at being deprived of shriving, or last rites, and confession. He took me even in the blossom of all my sins, full of bread, and at the pains of purgatory, were I permitted to unfold the secrets of my prison house, I could a tale unfold whose lightest word would harrow up thy soul, freeze thy young blood, cause each particular hair to stand on end, and so on. Hamlet's forbearance in the chapel, lest the murdered Claudius go to heaven for dying in prayer. That's a very Catholic moment. The recourse of royal influence to procure a Christian burial for Ophelia, despite her suicide. These are all residual fragments of an intelligible, prescriptive religious structure grounded in the authority of Rome and centuries of custom and tradition. <clears throat> in that footnote is the quotation from Harry Levin that I attempted to present. We need not forget that like every Englishman of his generation, Shakespeare had Roman Catholic grandparents or that his parents' generation had watched Protestants and Catholics being burned for heresy in shockingly brief succession. The 
corollary of that religious structure with its images and ceremonies is the hereditary monarchy with which it wrestled for so many centuries of competition and symbiosis between popes and kings. If you have an illiterate general population, as all kings and popes did in the medieval period, you had better demonstrate your power, sovereignty, legitimacy, by means which are specular rather than literary. The smells and bells, the stained glass windows depicting the Stations of the Cross, the majesty of the king in his ermine robes and gold. You've got to be able to understand this stuff without having to, without being able to read. Appearances, therefore, have to be reliable. Claudius is so destructive a figure not only for his crimes against his brother king, it hath the primal eldest curse upon it, a brother's murder, but for the damage he does to the succession. Aristocracy and monarchy depend upon claims of natural excellence symbolized in the outward opulence of ceremony and dress. The success of any usurper accelerates the, the decay of those claims and threatens to expose the real bases of power, military, political, and economic, hastening the rise of a mercantile class that can come by those real powers by other means than heredity, namely business. Claudius is a climber, a man of action who by his own acts of will and decision breaks out of the debilitating imprisonment of his birth as a younger brother, a king of shreds and patches, a cut purse of the empire and the rule that from a shelf the precious diadem stole and put it in his pocket. The chief characteristic of those who join his party, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, Osric, the unconverted Gertrude before the closet scene, and the nobility who have freely gone with this affair along is adaptation. That bourgeois ability to reinvent oneself in the spirit of the times. Dante consigned the opportunists to a special place in the vestibule of hell. In other words, that particular category of sinner called the opportunist. Neither in inferno nor out of it, because they lacked the will to choose the evil or the good, but adapted to each in the pursuit of their own advantage, like a situational politician. The fixity of meaning in hell and heaven, where value is no act of subjective inference, but a built-in aspect of the created cosmos, makes neutrality a contemptible crime. The divine comedy's happy outcome for man, which is what comedy means, a happy outcome, depends upon this fixity of meanings, which confers freedom upon us precisely by defining and delimiting the task of the will in the world. We have only to choose among alternatives whose goodness or evil is already written and legible in their surfaces. Elizabethan tragedy depends more than a little upon the Lutheran skepticism before appearances. There is nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. is a radical version of Luther's epochal shift of the sight of meaning into the person. Since faith alone justifies, says Luther, it is clear that the inner man cannot be justified, freed, or saved by any outer work or action at all. And that these works, whatever their character, have nothing to do with this inner man. On the other hand, only on godliness and unbelief of heart and no outer work make him guilty and a damnable servant of sin. So if you slaughter thousands of innocents because they do not believe as you believe, so long as you do indeed believe the right things, you will go to heaven. And if you feed and clothe the million, if you are racked by doubts about theology, you will go to hell and suffer eternal torment. That cannot be right, says the heart. And yet that is the evangelical position to this day. As the man is, whether believer or unbeliever, so also is his work good if it was done in faith, wicked if it was done in unbelief. Today one can hardly imagine penning those words. 
they strike me as utterly perverse. Hamlet seems written from a position of mournful, resigned Protestantism, still clearly remembering an innocence lost, remembering, as it were, a medieval consciousness, a consciousness of child confidence in appearances. Hamlet seems written from a position of mournful, resigned Protestantism, still clearly remembering an innocence lost, but all too aware of the new demands that drive it into modernity. We need Luther because we have Claudius. In other words, because the political realities show that appearances can be deceiving, one may smile and smile and be a villain, we need a theology which does not depend on appearances. The pathos of the closet scene where Hamlet confronts his mother in her bedroom or closet is Hamlet's amazement that he and his mother could interpret the same set of facts in such entirely different ways, with Gertrude suppressing and forgetting both Hamlet's father and the possibility of Claudius's guilt, and her son feigning madness in a refusal of the new realities that have ruined his hopes. The oppressive filial mourning lasts so long because filial love is inseparably bound to the broken dispensation of the Catholic past. See what a grace was seated on this brow. Hamlet, in the closet scene, shows his mother two miniature portraits. Often the director will show the miniature portrait of the dead Hamlet the Elder as hanging as a pendant around Hamlet's neck while the miniature portrait of the current king, Claudius, husband of the queen, is hanging around Gertrude's neck. And they are compared appearances for Hamlet in this instance are still reliable. See what a grace was seated on this brow, an eye like Mars to threaten and command Hyperion's curls, the front of Jove himself, a combination and a form indeed where every god did seem to set his seal to give the world assurance of a man. This was your husband. Look you now what follows. Here is your husband, like a mildewed ear blasting his wholesome brother. The new primacy of interpretation, the new heavier hermeneutic burden, is the product of the destabilizing of the world's meanings brought on by the regicide, the murder of the king, the assassination. It finds expression in the episode of the cloud at the end, construed successively as a camel, as a weasel, and very like a whale. The mendacious small talk about the weather in which Hamlet and Osric make it hot and cold and hot again by turns, and in the play within a play, since there it is the king's private reception of the public spectacle that drives him from the room. Your majesty, and we that have free souls, it touches us not. Let the gold jade wince. Our withers are unwrung. In the closet scene itself, the comparison of the portraits brings on Hamlet's demand, Have you eyes? As if his mother's mistake could only be a failure to see the evidence, and not a failure to interpret it. She can see the portraits, but not their significance. The ghost whose visibility depends upon the feelings of the observer is as invisible to her as it would be if she actually lacked eyes. Gertrude's afflicted conscience is clean on the outside because women paint. In other words, they put on makeup. As Hamlet complains to Ophelia, God gives you one face and you make yourselves another. The way of women is also the way of the court and of actors who put on makeup. Where deception and flattery rule, especially in the reign of a usurper whose authority depends on the continuous lie that Claudius privately calls my most painted word. In his attempt at contrition or repentance in the chapel, it is precisely the greatness of the object of his actions, not a straw, not a plot whereon the numbers cannot try the cause, but my crown, mine own ambition, and my queen that wrecks the authenticity of his repentance.
Forgive me my foul murder? That cannot be, since I am still possessed of those effects for which I did the murder. My crown, my own ambition, and my queen, may one be pardoned and retain the offense? In the corrupted currents of this world, offense's gilded hand may shove by justice. And after seeing the wicked prize itself buys out the law. But tis not so above. There is no shuffling. There the action lies in his true nature. In other words, there appearances are reliable in the next world. One does not sneak into heaven by deception. And we ourselves compelled even to the teeth and forehead of our faults to give in evidence. There is a polar opposition between the wicked prize itself buys out the law, where the object of action is so great that the abundant benefit easily pays the cost. You steal a billion dollars and you pay Congress a million from that prize and then don't get sent to jail. The wicked prize itself buys out the law. There's a polar opposition between that and Fortinbras quarrel in a straw, a plot of land which is not tomb enough and continent to hide the slain, adequation, the making adequate to one another between meaning and occasion can in this world only be evil and the punishment of it is located in the next world precisely where appearances are all too reliable. There is no shuffling there. The action lies in his true nature. Says the footnote, Hamlet's fidelity to his father, the legitimate king whose appearance accurately denoted his inward virtues, for every god did seem to set his seal, is expressed in mourning garments, the inky cloak and customary suits of solemn black that can denote me truly, are nothing less than a bid for the intelligibility of the world, the viability of custom and tradition, and the accurate outward expression in a community of shared stable meanings of the subject's interiority. Hamlet's great trouble then is that his occasion for action, unlike Fortinbras's occasion, is overwhelming. It's just too big. Ernest Jones says, to Hamlet, the thought of incest and parricide combined is too intolerable to be born. It's too big. Hamlet's great trouble, then, is that his occasion for action is overwhelming, and like his stepfathers, that's Claudius, the new king and assassin, too much invested in real consequences to qualify as a virtuous act of disinterested volition. All three claimants to the throne enumerate the tripartite object of the ghost's loss, Claudius's crime, and Hamlet's revenge. The ghost says, thus was I sleeping by a brother's hand of life, of crown, of queen, at once dispatched. And King Claudius says, uh, I am still possessed of those effects for which I did the murder, my crown, my own ambition, and my queen. And Hamlet says, he that hath killed my king and whored my mother, popped in between the election and my hopes, thrown out his angle or fishing rod for my proper life in order to reduce this triply great object to a straw, Hamlet undergoes a training in the vanity of human wishes in the graveyard scene where Adam, Caesar, and Alexander the Great are reduced to common dirt and the particularity of so colorful an individual as Yorick collapses into that archetype of natural man, the faceless skull. By putting on the rhetoric of Ecclesiastes, there's nothing new under the sun. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Hamlet can reduce his triply great object to the tiny scale of Fortinbras' five ducat field the straw, and win for himself the freedom to act decisively, and a man's life's no more than to say, 
one. Hamlet says to Horatio before his duel with Laertes, thou wouldst not think how ill all's here about my heart, but it is no matter. Nay, my good lord, it is but foolery, but it is such a kind of gain-giving as would perhaps trouble a woman. Sorry about that. If your mind dislike anything, obey it. I will forestall their repair hither and say you are not fit. In other words, if you don't want to go through with this duel, if you think they're going to cheat by, say, poisoning the rapiers, which they do, then let me know and I'll put a stop to the duel before it happens. Not of wit. We defy augury. There is a special providence in the fall of a sparrow. If it be not now, tis not to come. Excuse me. If it be now, tis not to come. If it be not to come, it will be now. If it be not now, yet it will come. The readiness is all. As Epicurus says, where I am, death is not. Where death is, I am not. If it is a nothing, it is nothing to be feared. And Hamlet's Utterance closes with this striking line, Since no man of aught he leaves knows what is to leave betimes, let be. Since you don't know what will follow after your death, you might as well let go. Which doesn't mean die, it means stop wrestling with fate. The last line is a combination of the lesson of the graveyard, that no earthly object of desire ultimately bears any value with the agnostic speculative awe of the fourth soliloquy, the undiscovered country from whose born no traveler returns. Line 216 is a much noted echo of Matthew chapter 10, verse 29, wherein all the apparent contingencies of history down to the fall of a sparrow are in reality the expression of an eternal omniscience. Nothing then is contingent. But where the gospel writer claims a fortiori, that this providence increases the significance of human affairs. Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? And one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father, but the very hairs of your head are numbered. Fear ye not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. A fortiori means on the strength. So on the strength of the proposition that God is seeing and even decreeing the fate of every sparrow, we can infer that the fate of creatures more important than mere sparrows, namely ourselves, must also be seen to, attended to, and even predestined by that same omniscient, omnipotent God. Hamlet uses the same figure to reduce human affairs to the triviality of the sparrow's fall. The a fortiori strategy, which I've just explained, is, after all, exactly the one that has failed him hitherto. This actor weeps for nothing, yet I, a dull and muddy-metalled rascal, peek like John of Dreams and can say nothing. What would he do had he the motive and the cue for passion that I have? Fortinbras and his army go to their graves like beds. How stand I, then, that have a father slain, and so on? Free will is constrained by the fixity of meanings under the sway of medieval authority. It then struggles to be more free by internalizing the responsibility for interpreting the world. But this only constricts the scarce space even closer. Hamlet finds his escape in a reduction of the stakes, exiting from the prison of this world whose horizon is that ineluctable hermeneutic circle from whose born no traveler returns, where born means threshold or boundary. The metatheatrical trope that governs the play's uttermost ending to tell my story, but let this same be presently performed, bear Hamlet like a soldier to the stage, flows directly from Hamlet's death and assimilates the threshold of life and death to that of theater and world that fourth wall which divides the audience from the drama. Tragic consciousness brings home from the evening's entertainment the lesson that compared to eternity, history 
is only theater. Thank you. I'm 48, and I like to say, when I was young, I thought Romeo and Juliet was about love. Now I realize it's about youth. Well, it was Jones's uh, argument that Hamlet is puzzled about why he can't just kill Claudius. That puzzlement means that the conflict he's experiencing must be unconscious, that things get repressed because we cannot tolerate them, that what is reasonably considered intolerable is Hamlet's own wish to do as Oedipus did and kill his natural legitimate father Hamlet the Elder and possess his mother erotically. That he can't face uh, so vile and transgressive and unconscious wish, but that he identifies unconsciously again with Claudius, who has done the very thing that Hamlet's id yearned to do. And that was Jones's argument. I don't think so. I think it was a rebirth of Paul, uh, of Pauline theology, which, after all, was an attempt to wrestle Christianity out of the hands of its Jewish originators and transform it from a Jewish sect, membership in which would require daunting rites of passage like circumcision, which no adult would choose, um, to exaggerate the point, uh, into something which is for all mankind. Hence, Paul says there is neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female, but all are one in Christ. Because he was selling it not to the Jews, to whom he was uh, indifferent and even, uh, might be better said, contemptuous, but to the Greco-Romans, to whom Judaism is this puzzling cult on the fringe of the empire. The Jews do not eat pork, the favorite meat of the ancient world. They have all sorts of bizarre customs, not blending cotton and wool together, for example. Uh, that's why there's so much anti-Judaism in the Gospels, uh, because it, they are an effort of outreach to the Greco-Romans. Uh, since works, deeds, are very much a matter of Jewish theology, uh, Jewish piety, rather, Paul emphasizes faith over works. And Luther does the same, hence his epithet, the modern Paul. Up until the invention of the microscope and the turn of the telescope toward the heavens, uh, science was a business of observation. Aristotle was an observational biologist. Uh, you look at things in nature and draw inferences because our senses are perfectly adequate to uh, gleaning truths about the empirical world, the world of experience, the phenomenal world, the world of what appears. But the microscope under the eye of Robert Hooke shows that what seems to be an empty table is in fact teeming with microscopic life, too small to appear. Uh, what looks like the Seven Sisters, the Pleiades, and the constellation Taurus is in fact a cluster of hundreds of stars. And that changes the status of science. Well, thank you so much. I'm a member of a Shakespeare company in Los Angeles called the Porters of Hell's Gate, with whom I've done some 10 productions, all Shakespeare except one production of my translation of Sophocles' Oedipus, which is um, part of the library here at NCP. I played Tiresias. There's a little YouTube film of that on my website, which is jamieheck.com, and you can see the spelling of my name on the copy of the essay.